Did you know that the uranium needed to create the first nuclear bomb was processed in St. Louis? Improper waste disposal contaminated suburban neighborhoods and created health problems in people living near the sites. In this interview, author and professor Linda Maurice chronicles a secret part of the Manhattan Project. Hey there, it's Kathy from HEC Books. Welcome, and if you're new, make sure to click the subscribe button. Now let's hear from Linda Maurice about her book, Nuked, Echoes of the Hiroshima Bomb in St. Louis. Linda Maurice, thank you for coming here today to talk about your book, Nuked, about the effects of the Hiroshima bomb on St. Louis. Well, it's nice to be here today, and I appreciate the opportunity. I will uh, tell you a little bit about it. Please, Uh, yeah. What I do in the book is to explore the effects of uranium refining that Mm -hmm. occurred in St. Louis, and the refined uranium was in the Hiroshima bomb, and uranium refining created a great deal of waste, Mm -hmm. and it was stored near the St. Louis Airport next to Coldwater Creek, massive amounts of uh, waste. And over the years, it uh, leached into the creek and contaminated, over time, large swaths of the St. Louis northern suburbs. I feel like this is a topic a lot of us in St. Louis and elsewhere don't know a whole lot about. Tell us just a little bit about that history and Mm -hmm. how this all originated. Scientists at the University of Chicago needed 40 tons of pure uranium in order to create the world's first controlled, self-sustaining nuclear reaction that would create energy that would uh, result in the creation of atomic bombs. And they didn't know if they could do it or not. But a man who had lived in St. Louis for a number of years, Arthur Holly Compton, was in charge of that lab. And he knew Mr. Mellencrot, whose company had a reputation for pure chemicals and also experience with ether, which was used to refine the uranium. So he came from uh, Chicago to St. Louis had lunch downtown with his old friend, presented the country's need, and Mr. Mallinckrodt agreed. They shook hands, and he went home and started doing it. And then uh, people don't know about what happened in St. Louis, but many of them have heard of the secret cities to create the bomb, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and Los Alamos, New Mexico, of course, where the bomb was created. And that's where our purified uranium went, to those two places and then ended up in the Hiroshima bomb. The uh, refining did not stop after the war's end, however, because we were in the Cold War and and compiling uh, a massive nuclear arsenal. And so it just kept piling up and more and more and more was sent of the waste was sent next to the airport. A lot of secrecy. A lot of secrecy. How does the Westlake landfill site tie into all of this? You had, at first, uh, uranium just at Mallinckrodt. Then it got moved to near the airport. And Mallinckrodt was on the Mississippi River. On the Mississippi River. So trucks, one after the other, were taking these highly radioactive materials out to the spot next to the airport and dumping it either uh, on the ground or in barrels next to the creek and the ground flowed down. So that was a poor choice. So there was this waste and the government agencies tried to do different things. They tried to sell it, you know, and they tried and some people bought it and some people shipped it west. And, but there was a company that bought some of this waste and because there were some elements in there that were potentially useful, but they still had a material that, that was of no use to them. Rather than following federal regulations, they mixed it with regular soil and dumped it at the West Lake landfill. And we're not really punished for that because at the time, the federal agency thought that it was under a tremendous amount of uh, municipal waste. It wasn't. It was under just a few feet of ground. You're a professor, so your book is really an 
quote, academic book, but mm-hmm. I want to make sure people understand. It's really very easily readable. It's not a, you know, a dense, hard text to get through or something. and has such a comprehensive picture and maps of this whole chronology of what happened, which I haven't seen in one place. And that's so I really enjoyed reading it for that reason. I have a better, much better understanding because what we tend to get here are little snippets of news stories about one side or another. It's not all been put together. Right, and that's what I was trying to do in this because I see my role as that of a historian. And historians, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a hydrologist, I'm not a, a chemist, but historians study documents. And so they, I, I can look at documents, look at maps, and draw conclusions about why certain decisions were made. And then that plus other, there are government reports, there are people's own recollections, like the head of uh, the Atomic Energy Commission saying nobody cared about waste. Well, that they didn't, and he was, he, he said the, the quiet part out loud, you know. But St. Louisans have gotten the information in dribs and drabs, and actually, it wasn't until 1978. Uh, when both of my parents were already gone, that St. Louisans had any idea that there was uranium waste here. And then uh, after that, uh, there were various uh, citizen groups along the way that raised concerns. But initially, the area that was cleaned up was right around the airport. And it wasn't until the 21st century, in 2014, that anyone ever uh, started sampling or remediating the vast areas of the creek that are north of Interstate 270, which of course is where we lived, where people in Florissant lived, Spanish Lake, Hazelwood, you know. So um, that that was important that that, that occur and then it's go- ongoing. But it is ongoing to 20. 20- 38, so that's kind of amazing. Did you speak to any of the people? You have a whole section, the third section of your book is the people, about the actual residents and people that you know of who were affected. Did you speak to some of them? Well, I I knew them as I was growing up, and I did some interviewing with people who were involved in advocate groups, and there is a lot of material, written material taken, statements taken of um, from um, the uranium workers, the truck drivers. There was work done by the St. Louis Post-Dispatch with lots of quotes in the 80s, Riverfront Times, you know, all of those. And I, I amassed all of those and then talked to people as well. Well, as I said before, it is a very comprehensive look at this and you see the timeline, you know, which it's very hard to get that just in little bits and pieces, but you did all that research for us and brought it all together into (laughs) this nice, you you know, a consecutive timeline. Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, I, uh, uh, I, it was a meaningful experience for me. It really was. So I hope uh, others can learn from it. That was my, that was my intention from the get go. Thanks for watching. In the next part of this interview, Maurice will reveal a more personal side to this environmental disaster. Don't forget to subscribe for new content and click the thumbs up button.